Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge and hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties. We had all the technical difficulties before the show started, so hopefully we won't. So today I'm really excited. I have my friend Kofi Apoku, right? I said it right? That's correct. Yay. Um, so I met Kofi. Kofi's another design professor and I met him at this conference that we both go to and I'll make sure I um, had gone to a talk that he was speaking in a panel um, and he was presenting um, his work. And then now every time I hear, see his name, I always go because he was such a good presenter. So he has a great story. I'm really excited to kind of get into that and, and talk about it. But he's an animator. He does uh, UX stuff, but he also really does some uh, design for social change, which is one of the first projects that I saw was this um, helping homelessness using Twitter, kind of getting the word out. So I really think he has a great heart. So I'm really excited to have you on the show, Kofi. Thank you so much, Dan, for having me. Of course. So give us a little bit of your background. You're from Ghana originally, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And then, so when did you start, um, when did your love for design start? And kind of give us just your background, what you studied, where you studied, and then how you got to the United States. Okay, so... Um, Sorry. Yeah, okay. that was because I had the other um, thing on, but it's off now. All right. So I grew up in Ghana. Um, Ghana is a country in the west west coast of Africa. Um, I think we are about 25 million people now. Uh, so it's really by in comparison to other countries, it's not a very big country. Um, so I spent uh, most of my life there, uh, education wise and everything. Um, Father was a professor as well, psychology professor. Uh, mother was a healthcare worker. Um, really um, kind of nurtured me, uh, especially my mom, uh, in the creative um, direction that I pursued. Uh, so when I started my undergrad, I, I initially went uh, to college to pursue painting. Um, yeah, I, I thought I was going to be uh, this fantastic painter. And then I <laughs> I got to college and I took one design class. It was like a foundations and graphic design class. And I really loved it. Um, it wasn't um, as bad as I thought it would be because I thought design was just so restrictive. Mm. But then I took this class and I really enjoyed it. And so I... Decided to major in graphic design. Um, many professors, but then there's one that really stood out to me. Uh, he, he studied here in the States mm -hmm. at Pratt's Institute. Um, and um, he really kind of nurtured the whole thing about ideas and concepts and the process of design in me. And so um, naturally leaving uh, undergrad, I looked to doing advertising because uh, I had a passion for ideas. And so that's kind of where it led me to. So. Um, just um, worked with a couple of upstart agencies um, and uh, just doing very basic design work. Um, and then uh, eventually joined a very prominent advertising firm, Originate Saatchi & Saatchi. Uh, worked with some brilliant minds over there, really fantastic creative director. Uh, some of the best, uh, the best team uh, that I've worked in uh, uh, a, thus far. They're a and worldwide so, uh, brand. I mean, there's Sachi and Sachi's everywhere, yeah. and you just happen to work at the one in Ghana, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, Sachi is a global brand, um, and so we have the affiliates being originates, which was in Ghana. Um, so yeah, I did that for close to six years. Um, and then I decided I needed more education. And so I came to the United States and uh, found myself in West Virginia, um, found myself studying graphic design under uh, some really fantastic professors. And they kind of impacted my thoughts and my direction a lot. Um, and so, so here I am. So and, uh, you sent me yeah. three pieces that you had done at Sachi and Sachi. So I just wanted to pull those up so people could kind of see what you were doing yeah, uh, sure. pr prior. So um, I'm going to put the link that's also on um, recharging you.com. If you look up Kofi, it'll it's it's there. So, but I'm going to put it over in the chat as well. So do you want to talk about this one at all? Or do you want me to just pop them up? Well, 
Yeah, I think uh, if you look at this, you see the influences of minimalism mm -hmm. a lot in my design. And that was really based on uh, based on my uh, undergrad professor who really impacted my thought and my design. So it was always trying to trying to get distill the uh, the basic essence of the idea and put it across. And so this was just it was an art for the agency that I worked for, it was an agency called Arts Bureau. And so it was just saying that we are creative people right. with sharp ideas. And that was how cool. it ran. All right, so here's the next one. Yeah, so this I did uh, uh, originate such and such uh, for a brand uh, known as Evelina. And the whole idea was um, they were marketing themselves as having their purest, most refreshing mineral water. So those two things come together, purity and nature and and so then you did there. a series of those so this mm -hmm. yeah so this is the last one in that series. Yeah, so. okay so now so you get to um west virginia so what did your dad teach i didn't ask you that the other day my dad so my dad was a, a psychology not professor. in the arts and also so, nope not in the arts. was very, your very mom an brain. artist <laughs> or is your mom an artist <laughs> My mom, uh, she has, I think, let me see, my mom is more creative than my dad was, you know. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, she has her hands in uh, several things. Uh, she's kind of a, a Renaissance woman, talented in so many different things. So, so all right. Yeah. So then you come to West Virginia and there was never, you just thought you wanted more education. You weren't trying to be a professor, right? That wasn't the life you had picked for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one step at a time, right? So, I mean, I just came here and I said, you know, I just want to try and make the uh, best use of my education as possible because I've always, I had always um, looked forward to getting a master's degree. Um, and so when the opportunity arose and I found myself doing this, I really just focused on getting the best out of uh, the degree. And then uh, I really had, I didn't make any concrete plans for life after school. All I had on my mind was just uh, spend time with my wife and kids. That's kind of, you know, everything else was going to come. And you of were kind of pushed, that. like being in advertising world, yeah. taking, you kind of wanted to do something that was more giving back. You knew that there was a power of design and you wanted to kind of pursue a little bit more in that range, right? Or that realm? Yeah. So uh, the thing about advertising and, don't get me wrong, I really loved advertising and I really loved uh, commercial arts and commercial design. But um, the issue for me was that it seemed so transient. It seemed so ephemeral. You, you just do the work and then it's, it's up for a few days. Mm -hmm. Someone just flips over the page and it's gone, right? No one ever uh, remembers it. Um, so uh, that's all the work and the sweat and the toil that you put behind it, it's its just a flip of a page and it's gone, right? So I felt like, you know, I needed something uh, much more uh, mm -hmm. deeper, something that uh, was much more meaningful uh, to me. So um, I still engage in some of it, but um, I really found myself doing this, this kind of work, because I think it's more fulfilling, right. more rewarding okay. for me. So, um you go and you you start studying this and you definitely, um, Eve Fox, she is amazing. And she was one of your professors now. She's one of your colleagues. And she definitely has, you know, doing a lot of social good with design, and which I think is amazing and that you guys are able to do that. So, um, so in from like, so was there not a master's program that you wanted to go to in Ghana, or was it just like, hey, I want to go check out America? Well, in Ghana, you don't have, um, I don't even think we have it now. At the time, we didn't have a master's degree in graphic design. All right, so you, if you needed a master's degree in graphic design, you had to get out of the country. Uh, so yeah, obviously, there were several options that I explored. Um, but um, one of the reasons that I chose America was because my wife had um, moved here uh, to also oh. pursue a master's degree uh, in um, hmm. instructional design. All right. So 
I I decided to join her here, here um, because that was going to be the best. Right, for those. sure. Yeah, you want to kind of be be with your wife. Yeah. That would be a good thing. Yeah. All right. So. Yep, yeah. Also. All right. So then. Um, I don't know which project you want to talk about first. If you want to talk about the water conservation or if you want to talk about the homelessness, I'd love to kind of, um, the first thing I saw you do was the Twitter, this Twitter um, game. And um, I'm going to put the uh -huh. video. I don't know if we can show a video. I've never tried that. I'm going to see if we can. We'll see. Uh, it says click to open link. So people can click on that. They can click on yeah. it and they can view it while we're talking, I guess. Um but, yeah. And then I can mm -hmm. show some of the other graphics that you created, but let let's talk about about that mm -hmm. that one specifically, um, and why homelessness, and then maybe why because I also think it did empathy, right? You were that was another part you were teaching. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I really arrived at this project on homelessness um, mainly because when I got here to the states. Um, I started working on some projects for my uh, my classroom work, and uh, I ran into a qu quite a non familiar issue. All right, the issue was that most of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, my audience they didn't really have a background for. They didn't really know much about it. So it really started off with the uh, um, the sanitation project. I don't think I sent you that, but I did a sanitation project for mm -hmm. Acumen Fund, which won an award actually. Um, uh, so I, I realized that how do you talk about these things? How do you talk about sanitation? How do you talk about water mm -hmm. conservation and all these other topics that uh, most Americans are not really um, familiar with, right? Because in America, water conservation is not, you know, we, we, you, you open your tap and right. the water runs, right? So I, I, um, I figured that I needed a way to get people interested in things that they didn't that didn't affect them directly all right so it was project by project and then finally arriving at uh, this project on homelessness which happened because i served a couple of homeless people um uh, sometime in 2012 yeah i think um that was uh with my church and so i i, I encountered some of them and i was like you know as a designer i don't really have any um uh, kind of financial capital or anything, but I, what I do have, the capital that I have is my skill. And so I'm going to use that to really speak about cool. this issue. Okay. So Brian pulled up your yeah. sanitation because he rocks. So if you want to see the link, there it is. So you had served at your church. It was it like a meal. You were doing like a Saturday thing or like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that was kind of like uh, uh, meals right. on wheels, I think. Is I think meals on wheels is for old people like who that. can't get out and. Um, okay. Get, yeah. But but it's like sort of like that, right? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, so sort of like you that. go and um, so you, you start this, and so why did you decide to put it on Twitter? And then it how was the empathy kind of pulled in? So I'm going to put some screenshots on, and then maybe you can talk us through it. And I don't know if I'm starting at the front or the back. So I think I'm starting at the front. I'm trying to start at the front, but hopefully you'll let us know. So. This was like the brand, right? Okay. Yep. So yeah, I mean, one thing that maybe I should speak about leading to this is that when I studied or when I worked in advertising, I really grew fond of uh, strategic development and all that because I worked with some really brilliant marketers. And so whenever I approach a project, I always start thinking through the creative strategy and I work through a brief, I kind of develop a brief for myself and I go through all those steps. Um, so with a project like this, I really started thinking through what are the key points that I need to highlight. All right. And I, I, um, I decided on um, really, I think there were four basic points. All right. Uh, and this was not my own um, kind of, um, Theory, but it was based on a theory that I adapted from Nathan Shedroff. All right, Nathan Shedroff is an information scientist, and um, and what he said was that there is there are in in the knowledge chain there are four basic steps: there's data, there's information, all right, there's knowledge, and then there's wisdom. So this is called a DIK. All right, wait, chain. wait, you're going too fast. So all I'm right, trying I, to take notes. So data, <laughs> information, knowledge, and then wisdom. 
okay. knowledge and wisdom. Yep. Mm -hmm. So DIKW. All right. So there is a DIKW chain. I think I have a, okay. a slide for that, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's kind of it should be a black oh, slide. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere. I have. Yep. With Sorry. A couple of yes, cycles. I do. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if that's this one, but we're gonna try it and see. Yeah, you can. There are yes. two two black slides. Okay. You can pull both of them up. Yeah. All right. So um, so using the DIKW model, uh, what I decided on, and this whole communications process was to try and figure out. Um, I have the data. I have the. I gathered the data on homelessness, but how do I present it so that people will really um, understand it? Uh, so that becomes the information phase, all right? The information is when you refine the data, all right? So I describe information as data mm -hmm. that has been refined. And then knowledge uh, was is described as uh, information that has been uh, contextualized, all right? And then wisdom is knowledge that has been applied. So what happened then is that I looked at uh, this uh, theory developed by Nathan Shedroff, and I kind of combined it with another theory uh, that was developed by Paul Ekman, uh, a social psychologist. So I know all of this is sounding I know, really, but I really have complex. A, I have a question. So with this <laughs> stuff like for information, yeah. uh, or not information, but instructional mm -hmm. design, was some of this stuff that your wife was learning or she was pulling in and she was telling you or is this you're just doing your own research i am I, okay. this was just my own research and i really i really love the nerdy things like this so just excuse me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i so i mean long story short is that i i combined these two uh, theories that was a, a social psychology model and then the dikw model and then I created this model that says that to communicate effectively about mm -hmm. social issues, you need to move people from just getting information to really having wisdom. All right. Wisdom is when they're able to take your product and you're able to use your product and apply it in ways that are unique to them. All right. And when wisdom is happening, you have better understanding. All right. So the less uh, you are, the, the lower you are in the chain, if you are at the information level, you really have less empathy, all right? But when you grow towards uh, wisdom, you are creating more right. empathy. Yes, absolutely. Makes sense? I no, that no that's great. But that's so. what I like, because you kind of have this plan <laughs> underlying. It wasn't just this kind of, um, it wasn't just kind of like, oh, I just tried this stuff. So it was really thought out. And But yeah. I, I think that's kind of a neat way to go about it. But you also knew that, um, and we have talked about this, and I think this was in some of the, my notes when I was taking notes. Was it was people knew about things, but they were, there was a, a problem of them actually. Um, so teaching them um, about it, learning about it, but then there was also the acting on it and doing, and that was a big part of this. Uh, and I think maybe that's where wisdom comes mm -hmm. in is is actually taking action. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Exactly. Yeah, so uh, with each of these points, there were specific designs that were created to speak to each point in the model. So for data, uh, uh, for information, I created mm -hmm. information graphics, and that is where you have, yeah. I think I have some of those screens there. Um, and then for knowledge, I decided to really uh, showcase some of the stories of these homeless people. So I really... Um, tell their stories and you get to really connect with so them like, emotionally. Can you see this banner that's um, below me? What is that? What would that be in? Yeah. This banner was okay. under the information so, level. So then, so you All were right. just posting these and you were tagging them so that people would. This was set up in uh, a room. All right. So the whole thing is to be experienced. Yeah. It was an exhibition. It's, uh, a whole, okay. uh, yeah, okay. it was an exhibition. All right, so you are, and it was a kind of a, a mm -hmm. linear exhibition. You had to go from step to step, uh, stage to stage. So you had to go through from the information stage to the knowledge stage, and then to the wisdom and that, step, wisdom, wisdom stage. Yeah. All right, yeah. So that's so kind that's of kinda where mm -hmm. it is. So it was three rooms. It was okay. uh, one room, three walls. Well, four walls, <laughs> right. three walls. Wages. I got gotcha. you. I'm with you. Okay, so. So keep yeah. going. 
I'm going to try to pull up images. Uh -huh. So yeah, so uh, again, info, infographics will be on the you know the whole learning phase, and then stories and animation will under the knowledge phase, and then the interactive games will under the doing phase. So that's kind of the wisdom phase where you have all the knowledge. Now I'm asking you to apply it right. to something real. So this is an information graphic. This would be in the very first this um, phase. Okay. Yep. The very so first I'm going to try to pull them up, but but I, they're by the names, and that you know I didn't make them. So all right. So yeah. I, I don't know where. Okay. I so it is mm -hmm. information inf game skill. That's later, right? That's a wisdom, correct? Okay. Yep. All right. So let that me just show wisdom. some people what the exhibition kind of looked like. So was this is this normal for yep. you to do exhibitions, or were you kind of doing something different by shaking this into kind of an exhibition market? Why isn't this one? Well, I was I was thinking of uh, the best way to get people to comprehend um, the entire project because I mean this is a a campaign, it's a multimedia campaign, and uh, you needed to take everything in at once uh, to be able to make sense of how to teach empathy, all right? Because that was the underlying principle that I was pursuing as well. The how do you teach uh, empathy, all right? So uh, my um, uh, thesis is that you you teach empathy by going from you know information through knowledge and then get into wisdom. So that's kind of why and it was said one about. of the things that I had taken notes on when you spoke about this was before was you saw that because we are so connected or because um, that there's less empathy and we're more can be more apathetic because we're more fo focused on self. So that was one of the things when mm -hmm. you are empathetic, you're actually more focused on other people. And you saw this as a change in exactly. society. So this is kind of helping people get back to that more empathetic life instead of an apathetic. Exactly. All right. So the, the whole theory is that, um, and it's kind of a paradox. The paradox is that we are more socially connected than we ever have been in history. But at the same time, empathy is going down. And so... Um, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. So, I mean, it's, I'm looking at, um, and I, I don't claim to be an expert in empathy studies. I am a designer. Right. <laughs> I still remain a designer. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, there is a redemptive aspect to some of even these social platforms uh, to make it do good things and to use it to uh, pursue good endeavors rather than to be... Um, uh, mean with them because if you look at some of the comments on YouTube and stuff, you ask yourself the question that you know why why are people uh, freely being able to uh, be sometimes very abusive even though it's supposed to be a social platform? All right, so is this paradox that is going on that that we are becoming more and more connected, but at the same time we have less feelings for how the other person uh, should really be. And what, what, how do you treat other people? So that's why I love that you did it on mm -hmm. homelessness yeah. because a lot of times people will just mm -hmm. overlook uh, people who are homeless um, and stop seeing the actual person. So I think when you go and you serve yeah. at your church and you were serving a meal, you actually saw them as a, a human being, not just something, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. So this yep. is a more later on, right? Is this, or is this, yeah, this is the okay, wisdom let me, phase. Uh -huh. let me, I'll come back to this one then. All right, so I'm trying to, the stories, you have two stories and then, yeah. Yeah, just those two stories. And then the animation will be the knowledge phase. I'm sorry, I no, should no, have done no. a better it's job. It's fine. So kind of explain, so this is another poster, kind of, but it mm -hmm. it could be a, a spread in a magazine as well. I mean, this is, the way it's designed, it could really work as a, you know. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Can you All hear right. me? So two, I froze. I froze for a second. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. sorry. Okay. And so then there's yeah. there's two of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you want me to talk about? Yes, this? please. Okay. So um, this I I kind of curated. Oh, I shouldn't say I curated. Someone curated these stories. All right. So there's a a website. <clears throat> excuse me known as uh, invisiblepeople.tv mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I got in contact with um, the curator of the website and um, 
what he does is that he interviews a lot of homeless people. And so I asked him, can I use your stories and make these creative pieces out of it? And he gave me the permission to do that. So what you have here are stories of real homeless people all across the United States. And it is really touching when you get to reading um, how positive they are in terms of their outlook on life, even regardless of their predicament. And uh, many of them have hopes, they have ambitions, they have dreams, they want to do good things. And you don't see that on the surface, all right? And that is a problem when you, um, we don't really have empathy. We, we tend to just look at things very superficially. We don't really like to understand uh, the stories of other people. So I think these stories really did a very great job of getting people to know that we are talking about real human beings. This, the, these are not just statistics. These are people, and these are people going through issues every day. All right, so that's awesome. So um, if they want to see the animation, I'm putting it over in the corner because I don't think I can play a video in these little things. I'll try one more time, but it's over there. So if you guys want to see it, it wouldn't let me do the last Vimeo. It wouldn't play, and it didn't look – yeah, it okay. looked funny. Mm -hmm. So, But it's over there. So – so that was one of the last phases, or that was, no, the was this is just the knowledge phase, right? The animation. Yeah, the the animation is the okay. knowledge phase. Yep, and then the wisdom is all the interactive. All right, so let's unless you so talk about the animation a little bit if you want. Yeah, so the animation, uh, I really arrived at that uh, kind of a very interesting uh, scenario. I. Walked down to a local homeless shelter here uh, when I was working on this project. And I had a conversation with one of the managers there who uh, happened to be a person who was formerly homeless. And the person told me their story of how they overcame homelessness. And I get home, and this is kind of a really weird design process, right? But I get home. And I, I didn't pull out my sketchbook first. I pulled out my notepad and I wrote a poem. I wrote a poem about my conversation with him. And I kind of like doing that from time to time, you know. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I wrote a poem called Lift. All right. I, at that time, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I didn't really know how it fit into my whole project. But then when I wrote it, I said, well, maybe I can turn this into um, an animated video. All right. And I started working on that. And I, um, I got a, a lady to do the voiceover for me with a lady with a British accent. <laughs> so that kind of worked out well. Uh, so that's uh, what you have with that animated piece. So it goes through, um, um, I think it talks about child homelessness. <laughs> like I'm trying to play back the animation in my mind. I think it, goes, it talks about child homelessness. And then it talks about uh, family homelessness. And it talks about veteran homelessness, uh, which are really really uh key right. uh demographic all right so the then stage. from that you take it to the interactive which becomes something that they are trying to save john right and so that's where we'll start we'll start with the mm -hmm. saving john graphic and then you can kind of take us through what you wanted people to do at the end of this exhibition and then it really went somewhere like it did something on twitter yeah so yeah, so after you have really read the stories and have um, understood the uh, plight and all that, uh, the point was to try and apply all that you know to something. And um, so this is not a real, real world scenario, but this is uh, uh, still kind of a hypothetical thing. And what happened here uh, was that there's this character, the pink magenta guy that you see on there, uh, that I nicknamed John. And the goal is that John has to get home, all right? So mm -hmm. home is on the right side, John is on the left. And uh, those uh, spiked balls that you see up there are uh, forces that prevent people from overcoming homelessness. So they are things like mental illness, healthcare, uh, lack of affordable rent, and uh, poverty in general. And so uh, to play this game, you have to tweet about homelessness. All right, and then when you tweeted, but, John will advance a step. But you were giving right, people so prompts so that you they didn't have to come up like I hate homelessness. Like you were like, here's a suggested tweet, right? Which, which I think <laughs> you didn't. If you hadn't exactly. given them, it yeah. would have been harder. And so again, you're making that um, 
process easier, yeah. but still people might not do it. So, okay, keep going. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I have. I think you can even see that at the bottom of the, the graphic. Like, uh, I think that it says, wondering what you can tweet, start right. here. All right, so there are suggestions that other people can tweet. And they have to use a hashtag and homelessness. And uh, so, yeah, each tweet advances, uh, advances John a step. And if he stood at one place for too long, those uh, spiked balls would just come spiraling down on top of him and he had to start all over. All right. So uh, it really took a community effort to try and get him to the other side. But at the same time, what was happening was that these tweets were being posted live on Twitter. And other people were retweeting it without knowing that all this originated from a game. All right. So you are really uh, spreading the word about homelessness. Right. Uh, well, and I, well, and I, well, and I love, love that somebody's trying to get out, out there and that you're giving these prompts. Um, and I, I do like that it's a community at community effort. So it takes social media, which is total community, but it can be apathetic. Because you feel like you can say whatever because no, you're yep. never going to be in the same room with these people. And then it takes it. Exactly. So I need mm -hmm. you. I need you to be friends with me. I need you to retweet this because I want John to get to the end. So there's that a personal exactly. reward, but it's that you're helping somebody else get to the end or get past that, which I love. I exactly. love that. So mm -hmm. the, it's multi-layered yeah. yeah. in Thank a lot you. of ways. So. It is. It is very multi-layered. So, so then what is this image? And this, this is part of the same thing. So it says press any key to speak. Um, yeah. So this is also at the wisdom phase where they have to apply um, their knowledge. And the thing here, maybe I should start by saying that one of the staggering facts about homelessness, if um, I don't know if we all know about this, but... Uh, the homeless really find it difficult trying to find jobs, all right? And the reason is because you need an address, uh, a, a physical address to, to be able to find a job. Now, how do you get an address when you don't have a home, all right? So it's kind of a, a, a chicken and egg situation because how, right. you know, which, ones right. come, which one comes first, right? So, um, so this was to try and present that issue to my audience by getting them to mm -hmm. apply for a job. <laughs> so this whole game was um, using voice recognition and you press a key and you, you ask you something like, uh, so how do you survive? And then you have to respond. And based on certain trigger words, it gives you another question. Uh, but ultimately it always ended up, and I know that's poor game design. It had one target, it always ended up telling you that, hey, you need to get an address and tells you that, you know, this is what this will go through and uh, some of All right, issues. so yep. so was this before you tried or this is just part of the game? The John stuff, before, or was it separate? Um, well, yeah, this is all on the same wall, so I don't really, I didn't really bother about where you started. You could do this first, you could do the John one first, but it's all on the gotcha. doing, okay. all on the wisdom. So, how many pieces were on each wall? Did you feel like they had to do more in the data or information so that they could move forward, or did you keep that smaller, or was there any kind of like target on what you were doing? I think it's, um, I really kind of tailored it to match the space that I had. All right. So, and if I were to do this again, I would really kind of uh, tailor it to match whatever environment that I'm working in. All right. So, uh, the one thing I have to say about this exhibition was that I wasn't really thrilled, particularly thrilled about the uh, orientation of the space. All right. Because I had some people going to wisdom first because they kind of have this whole artistic mindset that, you know, they just go to any piece that they want, right? But I wanted them to go in a very systematic uh, manner. <laughs> but I, I, didn't, I wasn't really successful with that. But it, so if I had to do this again, I will probably have um, maybe a, a, a narrower space that forced you to kind of move from one end to the other uh, rather than having uh, three walls that's kind of just right. enclosed an area. <clears throat> I didn't know if you would like make fake walls or if you would have like the things at the, when you're standing in line at the bank and they have those ropes, you know, that you're supposed to stay in this 
it, it's kind of funny because there is like a, a you know, forced direction because you're trying to see what people, but it would be interesting to know if, if more people clicked on it, if they had more data or if more people clicked on it, you know, or if they went, I, you know, how much, mm -hmm. if you could do testing on that, I think that would be cool. Your yeah, dad yeah, do yeah. it for you since yep. he's a psychologist. So anyway, <laughs> you're like, my dad's not doing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, so why, what started you wanting to work with empathy? Uh, was it something just innate in you that you're coming from Ghana to America and then you're realizing, or is it just something that you're just seeing in West Virginia? Like they're just really, you know, is, or is it just the people that you're seeing online and, and just interactions that you're having? Well, I think it starts from me just trying to understand things. All right. Most of my projects that I work on really have to do with the way I approach issues like that and so for the homelessness project for instance i wanted personally to understand it i, I really wanted to understand what was going on because um, it's um, a lot of people have a very romantic idea uh, of the states and it's it's a side of the states that you don't really see it's almost hidden all right so my exhibition was titled mm. hidden in plain sight all right so um it's me trying to figure out these things and then i I, I, I mean, strategically, uh, it's a pursuit in, you know, using the empathy models, I think is the best approach that I, I came across, you know. So, like I said, I'm no expert in um, empathy creation, and I, I really kind of shiver at trying to sound like one. So, um, just so you know, I am just a designer uh, who likes, <laughs> I am a designer who really is interested in um uh, 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 social work and stuff like that and uh, kind of different disciplines. I like to really learn about other different disciplines and see where it applies to my practice, but I Right, really right. Like and I'm not saying space. that you're an expert, but what you're doing was different in that you were testing and you were doing something that kind of mm -hmm. used these other um, disciplines to learn about this and then you're like, hey, I'm just mm -hmm. going to really see what happens. And I think it's good just to be able to experiment. But I think that you could have chosen to experiment about selling milk, but you didn't. You chose to experiment about homelessness and about yeah. something that you mm -hmm. and, and empathy. And it's a big that's a big subject. Yeah. And part of it then was also a rebellion, right? So there was this inner rebellion uh, because of my background in commercial advertising that I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I've had enough of all the commercial stuff and I want to do something different. And, you know, so I think coming here and really learning about these underlying narratives in design and what it can accomplish, how it can foster good in society was really thrilling to me that I never thought of it that way. Uh, I mean, in advertising, there were a couple of projects that I encountered that were like that. Like, um, uh, there's a TAP project that is run by UNICEF, um, and I really like the, the the campaign, you know. But I, I I hadn't really given it much thought that this could be uh, a direction for my work, you know. So uh, I guess I just rebelled against my consumer right based well, designs and and I um, I think that's where a lot of times they start. Yeah. So in the tenure process, Kofi is. In the tenure process and it's um he's in year three right mm -hmm. so yep. year Going three year you four. go up for a review and people say mm -hmm. hey what you know what, what awards are you winning how much are you presenting at conferences things like that and so those things kind mm -hmm. of matter so for yeah. you to do something that maybe kind mm -hmm. of so a lot of times we just have to have clients and we have to win awards like you said you had done um so it's this next kind of phase mm -hmm. and doing something that's more altruistic can be um, a great way to win awards and also get notoriety for the topic, right? Homelessness. But it, it can yeah. also, um, mm -hmm. it, it's just a, a area for your exploration. You could have chosen probably something easier, but I think it's great that you chose something like this. Yeah. So um, Kent wants to ask, Kent's yeah. also a professor. He's a professor in Mississippi at Mississippi College, I believe, right, Kent? Um, anyway, he says, is mm. homelessness, huh, homelessness the only issue you've dealt with? And it's not. So let's talk about some of the next things that you've dealt with. Um, so you tell me where you want to okay. go. All right. Um, 
Do you have any work you want to show? You so want to um, let's do digital. Back. Well, let's do um, the water conservation because that, again, something we don't necessarily, okay. we don't think about. And you've mm. touched on it a little bit, but we just drill wells. And so granted, mm. yes, why can't they just drill wells in Africa? Mm. They just don't have the funds or the equipment mm. to be able to do that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the water conservation thing was uh, really, uh, my objective with that was to uh, get college age students to really care about conserving water. All right. And it's not something that is right. uh, at the top of their mind, <laughs> you know, especially for college students. All right. Um, but it is a problem in other countries. And so you have this whole issue of, well, why should I care about what is going on in other places since I don't have that problem here? All right. But um, I think that's where this whole empathy thing comes back, that you there, there is something, uh, at least if you can change your thinking about it, mm -hmm. you can appreciate what you have and you can be more responsible with how you handle those kind of things. So I, I created um, a couple of posters and um, those posters are not shown here, but they are somewhere on my website. Um, but the, the idea with the poster was uh, I made... Um, uh -oh. Different characters using were really um, popular. I think they are dying down now. Um, and uh, I try to find things that college students care about: music and um, sports. All right, and I try to connect water to those activities. So I created a campaign called "What's Your Thirst." All right, and um, the idea of thirst there, used figuratively, will be. What are you craving? Uh, are you craving music? Are you craving sports, uh, some kind of activity? And so they, they look at this poster and the poster looks like someone playing a guitar, but then it's kind of made up. Um, you see all these little dots in there, which is an embedded QR code that you don't see immediately. Uh, but when they scan it with their phone, it led them to a website. And then the website started talking to them about, you know, uh, uh, try to connect the, their interest, which was maybe music or whatever, to water and how musicians still need to drink water and all that. So all the way leading to this animation that you are seeing or this screenshot that you're seeing. And this was a really um, artsy, uh, very deep um, animated piece that I did um, with. Um, I did the animation myself, but it was scored by um, a music student at, uh, in a doctor doctoral program, and I think I think he did a brilliant job scoring this for me. I just gave him the piece and asked him, "Hey, throw some music in this," and he composed a really nice piece and it ended up well. So yeah, the concept with this animation was, you know, there is this guy who leaves the tap running, and uh, he leaves home. The tap is still running, and um, uh, you know, he starts seeing all um, some kind of um, blemishes and stuff on his skin. And he is looking at it and he's wondering, well, what's going on? Um, and uh, at the end of the video, he turns into a fish. All right. And I thought a lot of people ask me, well, why did he turn into a fish? And, and the reason is that, you know, fishes need water to survive, right? And um, the, the animation is called Hick, uh, short for hiccups. And so the idea is that um, because the water was running, you know, the, the figuratively, I'm trying to express the idea that there was lack of water and he ended up kind of uh, gasping or gulping, trying to find water and he never did. And he literally became like a fish trying to survive. And that's a sad ending. It's kind of like a tragedy, but I hope um, <laughs> but, I hope we don't we don't get take it too serious. <laughs> but it's also powerful. So, like yeah. a hiccup, a hiccup is something that happens in our bodies to get our our heart back on rhythm. Like it's yeah. a natural thing. It's the uh -huh. way God made our hearts so that they would jump back if, if they get off. And so yeah. it's kind of like he has this, and he's going about his day. He's walking around. He's going to do things, and he sees these blemishes on his arms, and then his neck, and then his, and then the next scene, it's like. Like him on the ground mm -hmm. like that's the 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 road and then that's yeah. the sidewalk and yeah. he's 
not a person anymore. His shirt, you can see a little bit, is right behind there. And the link mm -hmm. is over there in the chat. I already uh, put that, and hopefully that, that works for everybody. But you can kind of see and, and watch that animation. So there's a lot, just like you did in the homelessness piece, there's a lot of kind of information and a lot of depth that exactly. can go. Yeah. And it was made to be shared, which is why it's, it's a very weird video. I kind of made it specifically for the YouTube audience. That's something that you look at them like, well, I just want to share this because it's just so weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. All right. So that, that's super cool, I think. Um, and so let's talk about, um, there was something else. When you presented at CCAC, you talked about having a user center um, which in a way is UX or UI in a way. Um, mm. It's a user-centered focus, um, focusing mm. on that user. Just like you said just then, um, you said, oh, well, it's a YouTube audience. That was what I was thinking about. Mm. And even you said it when you were talking about if I had that space again, mm. um, I would think about the audience and where it was and who was coming and what, you know, how many pieces I would put in, depending on who was actually invited or coming to this exhibition mm -hmm. and i think that that is a really that's the thing maybe that's missing so i have this um thing that i do every the beginning of every web design class or my senior graphic design class i really have I hate how people hand you change back um like if you gave them bills and then they give mm -hmm. you the your bills and your receipt back or whatever they always mm -hmm. give you the bills first because that's easier for them so they give you the yeah. bills and then they give you the change like the coinage, right? Yeah. And then you're trying to get it in your wallet or your pocket or whatever. It's uncomfortable. But instead, you should have a user focus instead of a me focus, right? The mm -hmm. cashier. Mm -hmm. It should be about the customer. And you should give them the change first so that they can hold it. And then exactly. they can grasp the yeah. bills in their hand. And I think that was one of the things that you focused on is in all these. And even with the water pollution, it's, mm -hmm. hey, yeah, it may not be a big deal for you because it's just your water and you can pay your water bill if you let it drip or run. But somebody else, somewhere else, and maybe hundreds of years down the road, they may need that water that you're just wasting. Yeah, right? and I, I think I think, yeah, I think that was really, really well said. You know, um, I think as designers, we do a very good job um, trying to put a user at the center of our process, right? And I... Uh, you know, you can go very far back, even in design history, and it was still a very user-oriented practice. It, it has always been that way, you know. But I think that when I when I look at making user experiences better, I think uh, I think of shifting, or not shifting, but I think of doing more than just having the user as as the center of your process. I think of having the user as the goal of your your product, all right? Not um, so. Let me give you an instance, an example. Like typically, when we design products, we will research what the user's needs are. We'll research um, all the things about the user, and we make something for them, and we tell them that this is what works for you based on all that I know about you, right? Now, I think that there is a little bit of a deficiency in there, all right? Mm -hmm. um, the deficiency is in that the the user never has any ownership of the products at the end, all right? So it's still this whole God idea of the designer. The designer is God. I step into the society, I make things better, and then I go away, right? <laughs> and um, so I, I think when you talk about making better user experiences, I really um, focused on um, trying to create forms and tools that can help uh, our audience even author content without necessarily changing the form. Uh, and I, I think that that produces more pleasure for the user, more, uh, it's a much more interesting experience for them. And that's kind of what even the Twitter game that I made is about, that uh, the risk of allowing your users to contribute content and um, being okay with that, mm -hmm. it's kind of where I think this is headed. And uh, I think designers should be open to allowing that to happen, All right? So more, more than just a process, more than just a user-centered process, but really thinking about the user as the goal of the whole thing and the user as the, the author of the product. 
and that instead of having so much control, maybe we're allowing it to them to contribute, I think. Yeah, allowing them to contribute to make it and being okay with when they break it. Right. <laughs> so how do you teach that? How do you teach um, designing for a user experience or how do you, what do you, what kind of things do you t tell your students to do? Because sometimes people aren't doing that. So they need, uh, if they're freelancers or they're working in-house and they're trying to do some stuff on the side, or they're just trying to be better at their job as a designer, what would, what are some exercises or something that maybe you teach um, that could help us? Well, I mean, um, primarily, I mean, everything that I, we do in the classroom, and I'm sure is with you as well, um, is, practically going to incorporate, you know, have the audience as a, as a center of their practice or for whatever, whatever projects. We always talk about, um, you know, knowing a lot about your user or your audience before you actually design something. Uh, my approach to teaching uh, has always been to engage. And I think this kind of goes back to my model and theory that I drew for my homelessness project. Mm -hmm. I kind of like to get into the head of my students first all right, so I, I really love the cerebral aspects of design. Mm -hmm. And I think and I love to teach that because um, uh, I think designers need to be able to think and think through issues and ask questions, ask the why questions and all that. So I always start with the uh, thinking, all right? And then, um, so the process is gonna come in there and all that. Uh, and then also like my students to feel, all right? Mm -hmm. I, and I, I think that's, where the emotional connection comes in that, you know, it's kind of hard to get excited about every project, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I think you can design your, your assignments or projects in such a way that your students can, you know, kind of add a little bit to it and get excited about it. So I, I always teach them that, you know, um, emotions are okay. Emotions are good for design. It's good for you to feel passionately about what you're doing. All right, so there's this whole maternal thing about design that we really care about what we are doing and we want to kind of cater it very well. And then um, maybe finally what I do touch on a lot is uh, that we are still uh, primarily makers. We, we still make stuff, all right? So we, we need to learn how to make. So when I teach web design, I teach them how to build websites from scratch using just code. Mm -hmm. And it can be very frustrating, um, but... <laughs> But at the same time, I think that designers, we need to learn how to be able to craft things well, uh, make them, you know, look good and all that. So, yeah, so thinking, feeling, doing uh, primarily governs most of the things that I teach in the classroom. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we're thinking I'll give them a lot of readings to do just to try and get their brains working and, and all that. And even with feelings, we sometimes work on projects with clients and mm -hmm. there they are forced to kind of develop empathy and affection for the project so it sounds like you even in the classroom with particular projects you're doing the the four things like the data info knowledge so if you're having them mm -hmm. learn about do the, do some research research on their own but then you're also having them there are these stories that you're having them read right so it's kind of like yeah. the story so it's in in a way it's kind of the way you teach but it would be great for people to as designers to do that for each of their clients okay so you've exactly. given me the data and we know what the goal is. We want to make more widgets or whatever, make more pool noodles and then and sell more <laughs> pool noodles. But how can we get people to, you know, be connected to these pool? No I don't know why I'm stuck on pool noodles. It's hard to say, actually. All right. It works. <laughs> but, but I think that that to me, that can be a struggle for it's it's not an issue for me. I feel blessed that. Um, I feel like that's one of my superpowers is like I have a client or I meet somebody and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's great. Let's do that. Let's, you know, yeah. like I can see how that would help them. And I think that as a designer, we do kind of in a way have a little bit of a God complex, I guess. Not really like yeah. we're God, but we do come in and we kind of help fix things and set things up. And then then yeah. you go and go. Mm -hmm. do. Um, so, yeah. And I had never thought about that. So it's a really kind of good uh, point. But really, I feel like it's also a, a team because I also feel like God doesn't leave us, you know, like he's yeah. with us. Um, exactly. And, and as a designer, that's the best kind of designer is a designer that becomes part of the team. And I think 
some students have a hard time getting on board um, with some projects. Well, I don't do whatever. And sometimes I'll do something on purpose, like do something that's um, um, a, a typical um, thing that only a girl would use and then mm -hmm. give it to a guy and they have to work on the campaign. And I think mm -hmm. it can be a, a struggle because they're like, well, I don't do this. I don't use this. But I think it's a really good wait, just like what you're saying, like get them to think about it and then get them to yeah. get in the shoes and feel like they're the. Yeah. So perspective taking, just take the other person's perspective. Yeah. That's, that's really good. All right. So, um, all right. So then, um, can you talk a little bit about digital pollution? Cause I know we have five minutes left. Can you believe like we still didn't get too many. It was, oh, wow. I, know. I was wondering what I was going to be saying for one hour. And there we are. We have five minutes left. <laughs> I know uh, we still didn't. We're just on question seven. So tell us a little bit okay. about digital pollution and I'm going to pull up the images or I'm going to put the video okay. over in the side verse. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, digital pollution, again, um, like I said, everything starts from me. Um, I look at my life. I look at some of the things that I struggle with or some of the things that I want to know about. And then I learn it or know about it and I kind of spread it. All right. So it really is a critique of my, own life, all right? So uh, I used to be growing up very, very fascinated with all things natural. In nature, I like to look at trees, I like to look at the clouds, I like to look at leaves, whatever, and not even how objects interacted in a natural space, mm -hmm. all right? But um, for some reason, um, I think in my adult years, that has gone away, and that is partly, uh, I think I can attribute it just to the, the whole... Um, the inundation of digital devices that I, I have, and I'm always distracted with them. We're either working on the computer, or I'm looking at something on my phone and all that. So I really wanted to make a commentary on this, make a commentary of my, um, um, you know, the distraction that really occurs with all these digital devices. And so what I did was I took pictures of very mundane things, mm -hmm. and um, I tried to, uh, the, the thing is, uh, I made an application that's kind of um, makes you want to look at these pieces. You want to look at the tree, or you want to look at the building, but then you are not able to uh, because whenever you step in front of the computer screen, so this was a computer piece, mm -hmm. to look at them, you get this distortion, all right? So it uses motion uh, detection. So you step in front of it wanting to look at it, and then you start getting the static noise, and you get all these uh, vibrations and distortions which are in some ways beautiful. I wanted them to be beautiful, but then uh, at the same time, it kind of frustrates you a bit because you, you can never really seem to stop and just look. All right, so I wrote that algorithm to make it do this, uh, create these really uh, interesting patterns, and I recorded sounds of my computer, of me typing on the keyboard, of my cell phone, and then um, what I about these pieces. So now the last part, and I think you brought this up, but that this was a collaborative piece. And so I worked with traditional print makers. And what they did was that they took my digital pieces and they screen printed them. Um, and, um, and so that's kind of what you have, the, the result of what you have here. So these are the pieces too on the right uh, were screen printed. Um, and um, I, I like the outcome. You know, it was it was very challenging working with uh, very traditional artists, especially because my work is very digital. Uh, but I think it forced me to really jump out of the whole um, everything has to make sense thing and be an artist for once in my life. <laughs> so so yeah. um, I was telling Derek earlier, who's at Findustry, Derek Friday, and I was like, oh, this stuff reminds me of his. So you and him should connect because... Um, so Derek, it's okay. on, um, oh, Derek, I, it, I think it's Derek Friday on Instagram and you see his stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, the, to me, this stuff totally, and he's a real good collaborator too. So, um, but okay. I love like, to me that the one right underneath me, um, the one to the right, yeah. which is the digital thing there was anyway, I'll tell you a second, but that one is beautiful. Like I love the color of trees in the winter uh -huh. and then this when the sky is that and then it 
It yeah. kind of has yeah. that, like, you know, in Missouri, the arch kind of has that arch kind of feel. Uh -huh. um, but uh -huh. it definitely uh -huh. doesn't look um, natural. It looks more man-made. But... So, yeah. but I just really like this piece too. And I like that it's um, more uh, cerebral, I guess, in a way it kind of forces mm -hmm. you to do that. So I just really like this piece as well. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love them too. I really loved, I, I love the process. I love working with those guys. At, uh, these were the guys at Air, Air Gallery at Pittsburgh. They are really fantastic. So That's I really awesome. enjoyed it. Okay. So um, Joseph was asking earlier um, that um, he said, do you do speaking engagements or how, what's the best way to reach you? So I'm going to share your uh, Twitter handle, but I don't know if there's yeah, another sure. way, if you want to share an email or whatever to be able to, you don't have to, but they could look you up at West Virginia University, correct? Yeah, so uh, they can get in touch with me via my outdated website. Okay, I will, which... <laughs> I will share that right now. Yeah, the website is there. And just so your audience knows, I will be working <laughs> on that website this summer. <laughs> yeah, I teach web design and my students have websites that look way more better than mine does. So it's... Uh, I think that's testament to. But you're, yes, teaching. you're not alone. <laughs> and uh, Derek says the same thing. So I know that as well. I yeah. uh, mine has been down since I think 2014. Little Bird, uh, my company. I just yeah. am too busy doing client things or too busy doing design recharge or things like that. Which, um, uh, I guess that's that's always a good good thing to be busy. But. So yeah. tell me real quick, yeah. as I know we're over time, but tell me what's next for you. What is, are you going to keep working on the digital pollution? Do you have another thing that you're really passionate about? Well, I think lately, uh, my I'm still going to I still have my hands in this homelessness thing that I'm doing. Um, uh, there are several offshoots of my initial campaign uh, and several collaborative things that I'm working on this summer. Um, but uh, I've become really interested in mm -hmm. just storytelling, and um, I'm really uh, looking forward to doing something with that, uh, some kind of interactive storytelling. And I like the idea of having multiple platforms and multiple mediums and stories that are not mm -hmm. very linear, stories that kind of connect uh, different mediums together. So I don't know what that looks like yet, but I've been thinking, I've, I've had a, you know, I was at um, CCAC last year. And I think when um, during some of the sessions, I had the wonderful uh, sketch pad or notepad that you gave to me. And uh, I have I have like 15 ideas in there oh, good. things I want to do. Uh, and it, it goes from performance-based things to animations to, you know, interactive things and um, kind of up Well, next time when you have a new one, let me know if you, if I didn't see you present it somewhere and then I'll have you back on the show and then you guys, you can um, tell us all about it again. Cause I just think it's yeah. really nice that you are so smart. And so I'm just glad you're friends with me and um, I'm just glad to be here. Cause I think you have a great heart. And I also think you're really, really, um, the way you can analyze it and kind of plan it out is really nice and helpful. And I know I, sometimes I feel like we're blessed because we're teachers that we get a little bit more time to work on things. We definitely give our students more time than they're going to get out in the real world. Yeah, But yeah. I actually feel like we have some, um, I mean, you worked at Saatchi and Saatchi and that's a really a well-known, really hard to get, kind of job and I just love that you kind of left that to go do something and that was more true kind of to your heart and so I just want to help you any way I can and so let me know next time you have a new project and we'll um you since you have 15 ideas that's 15 shows Kofi <laughs> yeah thank you I, I really I really really appreciate you know uh the time I I learned a lot from you know from you as well and even from you doing this show so that's that's great you know, so I'm um, looking forward to it. Anytime uh, you want us to talk, I can do that. And um, and thank you, uh, audience and everyone, your wonderful questions. I think this is the first time I'm doing something that is kind of live and interactive like this with live comments. Yeah, it's, it's great. Kind of and I feel like they get to know you. Yeah. And then, but then they get to, 
interact with you. So to me, this is uh, when I've changed platforms, this has been the one thing that I've always said that I wanted because I feel like it's so important to have them here live because um, they they get a break in their day. They can take a late lunch or an early lunch. And depending on where they are or if they're in Ghana, they're definitely, okay. how many hours different is it? Four hours oh, so plus that's not four, really that bad. Hours. But it'd be a really late lunch. It could be an early dinner. Yeah. But, but you know, like, I just feel like it's a nice way to come. And then it's kind of a community. Like, Joseph comes a ton. Doc's been on before. Doc comes. Um, and so it's just really nice to to see everybody. And uh, Doc says it's a second lunch. But I, I think it's it's really nice. <laughs> and it's a weekly thing. And so, but to me, instead of just having an interview that's recorded, it's nice to see uh, Fabio says just coffee, but it's nice to see what they're saying. I feel like whenever I've done yeah. these and I've just been awesome. in the chat, I feel like I'm part of it. Like I feel like I have a voice, and I think for me that's really important that they have a that anybody coming has a voice, not just me and you. You know. Great, great. That's that's <laughs> wonderful, Dan. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. And so me. Joseph says, thanks again for another great show. I won't be in. Oh, so he'll be en route to Raleigh. And I will we'll see you in Raleigh because I'll be at the AIGA um, leadership retreat. So I'm really excited um, to oh. meet you in person. Jo in person. I can't even say in person. In person. And so I am still doing a show next week, but I'll be um, doing it from my sister's house. Right. And next week I have on uh, Matt uh, Dawson. Dawson, Dawson, right? I don't know. I just blinked. I should have had like, should have like I have all these post-its on my computer, but I, anyway, I think the whole computer thing messed me up. But anyway, he did, he started his first conference called Crop and it was um, a week after Creative South, which Kofi, I think you should go to Creative South. This is my absolute favorite conference. Um, very affordable and a ton of great designers and illustrators. And so you should totally go. But um, and it's in okay. April, so I'll send you the information so you can get uh, on on it. Do that, yep. But it's really Let's cool. So it. anyway, so Matt, I met him there, and um, he started his own conference in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So it's nice to kind of have everybody um, uh, seeing how somebody started a conference. He lives in Atlanta, started it in his hometown of Baton Rouge. So I'm excited to talk to him. Um, and Jason, is that his last name, Dawson, Matt? Is that wrong? Any anyway, okay? Yes, thank you. Whew, shoo. All right. So, Kofi, thank you so much. You're so talented, and I'm so glad that I got to pick your brain a little bit today. And um, I'm just real thankful. So, guys, I will see you next week at two thirty. But it won't be in this room. It'll be at my sister's house or at somewhere where she's working, where she's going to let me do it. So, anyway, thank you guys for coming, and I'll see you guys next week. And thank you, Kofi. Thank you. That was fun. Great.